16. So let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I told you. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will. I like it. He didn't yeah. say I might. Definitely. He said possibly. No, I will come again Amen. and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. I'll tell you, that's a, a great truth in the Word of God. Uh, all through the New Testament, Jesus promised to go away, but he also promised to come back. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 1, when uh, uh, the disciples saw Jesus uh, sitting up into heaven, uh, they said, uh, two men in white apparel said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, you see him go up into heaven, will come again in like manner. Uh, and so uh, there is a promise again of his coming. And uh, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but I'm looking forward to it. Amen. I'll tell you that's for sure. In your Bibles, if you will, turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 22. Chapter 22 of the book of Luke. You have a hard time finding the book of Luke? It's in the Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you get to John, you've uh, gone too far. If you get to Mark, you haven't gone far enough. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While you're turning to the book of Luke, chapter number 22, I uh, want to ask you a question. And this question has a lot to do with the message today, and I'm not going to ask anyone to stand and speak unless the Lord directs to do so. But uh, just think for just a moment while you're turning to Luke chapter number 22, what one individual in your life has been instrumental in shaping your values and your direction in your life? What one individual? Now, in my life, there are a number of those individuals that uh, kind of brought me along and kind of helped me. Uh, we might call them, in, a, in today's vernacular, we might call them mentors, or we might call them uh, teachers, or we might call them, uh, uh, you know, mom and dad. We, we might call them in a, in a number of roles, but there are some folks in our lives that have shaped and molded us uh, to bring us about where we are today. Uh, I don't remember the name of the teacher, but when I was in the fifth grade, uh, I, I had a teacher. Uh, we were in, uh, in Limestone, Maine. We were in a military, uh, on a military installation, Limestone Air Force Base. And when we were in that school, I had, uh, up until the fifth grade, I had been in a number of different schools. I've uh, been in school in Puerto Rico and Mississippi and uh, in Maine. And uh, so I had traveled quite extensively in the first a few years of, uh, uh, of my schooling, and when I got to the fifth grade, I had a teacher that said, I don't remember her name, but she realized that I could not read. Now, I could, I could read words on a page. I had memorized words. I could look at words, and that's the, and and, and if, and, and but, and I mean, I could, I could read words, but I couldn't read. You say, well, how can you read words but can't read? Reading is more than just put, looking at pages of words on a page. Reading is comprehending what it is that you've read. And when I got to the fifth grade, my teacher realized I was not comprehending anything that I was reading. And so she began to work with me on a daily basis before school, uh, after school, during recess, uh, to help me. And by the end of the fifth grade, I was able uh, to be able to read. And I'm thankful that that teacher realized that uh, she had a student in the fifth grade that could not read. There's others uh, in my life when I got saved at the age of 16. I was not a Baptist. I was not saved in a Baptist church, but uh, I got saved and uh, gloriously saved. God saved me. Uh, unfortunately, the church that I uh, belonged to at that particular time could, didn't believe that you could get saved and, and know it and keep it and all of that. And, uh, but I had a youth pastor uh, at that church uh, that uh, uh, after I got saved, he said, now on youth night, on Friday night, I want you to lead the singing. <laughs> I said, not in this lifetime. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. He said, are you saved? I said, yes. He said, then if you are saved and you are a child of God, then you are obligated to God to do whatever they ask you to do within the ministry. And that set a precedent in my life not to refuse 
anything that God had asked me to do or a man of God had asked me to do. Now, from that point in time, I, uh, I got out of that church and got into a good, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, uh, King James-only, soul-winning uh, Baptist church. And I had some mentors uh, in my life that helped me and shaped me and, and, and brought me about to where I am today. Uh, my pastor, uh, Brother uh, Bill Riddick, uh, started a church in a swamp. They told him, you can't build a church here uh, that will sink and, and, and all of that. But he bought the property on Highway 90 in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Uh, he built the first building that's still there to this very day. Uh, he built another building. We ran at that time, uh, when I was there, 23 buses. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we averaged about 1,500 on Sun Sunday morning. I mean... They said, you can't do that. Now, uh, Brother Bill Riddick was a, a mentor of mine. He took me under his wing, and, and, and he taught me some things, and he, he uh, uh, helped me to, to learn the Word of God and have to appreciate the Word of God and appreciate uh, the souls of men. And he brought in such men as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lester Roloff. Lester Amen. Roloff didn't like to be called doctor, even though he had a doctor's degree. Uh, but Lester Roloff and uh, uh, Carl Hatch and uh, Bill, uh, John R. Rice and uh, Jim Vineyard and, and men like like that, uh, uh, Jack Howe, men like that that shaped and molded my Christian worldview. Yes, sir. And I can go back and I can, I, can, I can go back to each one of these men and say, these are men that, that taught me something, that helped me, that were a benefit in my life, and that were a legacy to behold. I am where I am today, not because of Jim Lamb, but because God placed in my life and placed me in places where men of God could shape me and mold me and bring me about to where I am today. It, I, I didn't get here on my own. I hear people say, often, I'm a self-made man. <laughs> I'm not a self-made man. Amen. I, I've heard people say, well, I, I did this all on my own. I did not get here all on my own. I got here uh, with the help and uh, with the love and the compassion of men of God who were willing to take me under their wing and teach me and train me and lift me up and encourage me and to promote me when I would rather be in the back uh, in the back hallway rather than be here in the front of you. I would much rather be doing some other things uh, as far as the ministry is concerned. But God has called me and used me and, and brought me to this place today. And so what I, what I want us to understand in 2013 is that we want to build an enduring legacy. We want to build an enduring legacy. How are we going to do that? Who are we going to influence? What, what person, what individual is coming behind us that, that needs someone to, uh, to uh, look to to help them, to strengthen them? This world is not the, the role model that we need to be looking at. When we look at, uh, I, I watched the Texans game yesterday. You go, bring your jaw back up. It's, it's okay. I actually watched the football game yesterday. Yes, I did. And, and, and you know, J.J. Watt and uh, Arian Foster and, and, and Shaw and, and all these guys, I mean, they're building them up and they're promoting them as good role models, as good people to, uh, to look to and to, uh, to, uh, to maybe shape and pattern your life out. But if these men are not men of God, if these men are not uh, standing on the principles and the truths of the Word of God, they should not be the mentors, they should not be the, uh, the teachers, they should not be uh, the people that are molding and shaping the youth of America. It needs to be the men of God and the house of God and the people of God. And so this year, we want to, to set a vision. We are going to find somebody in, in our life. We're going to find somebody that we're going to bring up behind us. We're going to find somebody that we can mentor, somebody that we can be a part of their life and help them and teach them and train them to become what it is that God wants them to be. If you look at Luke chapter number 22, and I invite you to stand with me in the reverence of the reading of the Word of God. Uh, I'm just going to read a few verses here in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 34. Luke chapter number 22, verses 31 to 34. Notice what he says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, 
that, ye may, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee Amen. that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou, that thou shalt uh, thrice deny that thou knowest me. I want you to look at verse number 32. Jesus tells Simon, Peter, he says, Peter, Simon, he said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And the, the focus today I want to look at is in that phrase, strengthen thy brethren. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you this morning, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would bless this first service uh, of 2013 at the Garth Road Baptist Church. Lord, I, I know that, that we have a folk here, we have a people here that have are desirous, Lord, to see you do a work, to see you do a, 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 a miracle in the hearts and the lives of individuals. Lord, we, we, we desire to see you do a work in the hearts and lives of those that are saved and those that are unsaved. Father, I pray that today that you would help us, Lord, to, to, to set a goal in our hearts and in our lives and in our minds, uh, Lord, that we would, would seek and, to, and, and desire, Lord, to raise up uh, somebody behind us, Lord, that would have the, uh, the credentials, that would have the, uh, the blessing of God upon their life to, to go to the next level and to bring somebody behind them up to that level uh, of honor and service to Thee. Father, speak to our hearts today, for it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. As we look at our text today, as we look at the verses that are surrounding uh, our text today, we find that uh, Jesus is, uh, it, it is the time of the Passover. And Jesus is observing the Passover with his disciples. He institutes the Lord's Supper and, and, uh, and, and something that we, uh, that we celebrate, an ordinance of the church. It is not something that saves us, but it is a remembrance of his coming again. This do, he says, in remembrance of me. And then he goes on and, uh, and, and tells them, he said, now one of you are going to betray me. One of you are going to turn your back upon me. One of you are going to go to the, to, the, to the religious leaders and to the chief priests and to the Pharisees, and you're going to sell me down the river, and you're going to uh, do for monetary gain uh, what the world has been trying to do for, for centuries is to destroy the, the personage uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of his coming. It happened all the way from Genesis chapter number 3, that when they tried to destroy the, uh, the Christ child, they tried to destroy the, the plan of God. God, and it has not worked. And, and, and Jesus is, is, is now beginning to teach them and say, look, I'm fixing to be offered. I'm fixing to die. And uh, Peter has stood up and said, hey, <laughs> Lord, no, no, no. And Jesus looks at, say, say, uh, at Peter and says, get me behind me, Satan. He said, you, you, you are trying to hinder the work of God. Yes, I am going to die. I am going to give my life. I am going to be buried. I am going to rise the third day. I am going to ascend it up into heaven again. And I will come again and, and bring you uh, that peace and that hope and that joy that you need. He's, he's, he's teaching and he's training his disciples. And then he comes to Simon uh, Peter and he says, Simon, Simon. Simon, Simon, Peter. That's who he's talking about here. Notice what he says. He said, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan hath desired to have you. It, it is Satan's desire to destroy you, Peter. You see, anybody that's doing anything for God, anybody who is standing for God, Satan seeks to destroy. He seeks to destroy right. the, uh, the individual. He seeks to destroy the marriage. He seeks to destroy the home. He seeks to destroy the house of God and the church of God. Satan's desire is to keep down and to suppress the things of God. 
We have, we have seen it uh, uh, spread across the uh, United States of America, what was supposedly a Christian nation founded upon Christian <coughs> principles, men of God who, who stood and said, this is the way we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. This is how we are going to accomplish what it is. And now we have a president that, that is seated in the White House that says that that is a bunch of bunk, that everything that we were taught in our history books was a lie, and that the men of God did not found America on Christian principles or the word of God. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Amen. But you see, the problem is, is that we have, have, have taken second of fiddle. We have, we, have, we have gone to the place of allowing the world to teach our children. We have gone to the place of allowing uh, uh, the, the world to be the mentors, the world to be the, uh, the director, the world to, be, uh, to, to teach them and train them uh, in the things that, of this world. And we have forgotten to teach and train them in the things of God. That's right. Our churches have become social clubs You're with right, nothing right. more on for right. our youth than to have a, a video game night where they sit there and play yeah. uh, video games hour after hour after hour, and they teach them nothing about the Word of God. Right. It, it, we, we have come to the place of, uh, of having different types of churches that, that cater to the different types of people uh, that, uh, that, that cater to their hopes and their desires and their wishes and it does not bring them any spirituality, does not bring them any place in the, uh, in, in the kingdom of God. They're not preaching the truth of the worship word of God. It is a social gospel that says you come and you be happy and God wants the best for you. And thousands of people are dying and going to hell You're right. You're as a result right. of that. And it is about time yeah. that we, as yeah. God's people, and we that have the truth of the word of God, need to stand up and say, hey, we need to, we need to raise up a generation after us. Amen. Have, you, have you looked at the scene? <laughs> have you looked at the, at the polit political climate in America? Have you seen what's coming up in the ranks? Behind us? Wow. Travesty. We have, we have people that are coming up behind us that have no ethics. We have people that, come, that are coming up behind us who have, have no morals. Yes, sir. We, we are coming up with people behind us that, that think lying is, uh, for the benefit of, of the, the bottom line wow. is the way to go. And the sad thing is, and the sad commentary is, we have preachers that believe the same thing. Yeah. If it benefits me, if it lifts me up, if it encourages uh, me, if it brings more money into the church, if it brings more people into the church, I'll sell my soul down the river so that we can have more. That's why the Garth Road Baptist Church isn't the biggest church in the world. I'm not for sale. Amen. You're not going to buy me. You're not going to say, "Hey, I'll give you a, a, a lucrative salary, and I, I, I will, I will, I will, I will take care of you, and I'll put you in a in a four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar uh, mansion, and I will take care of you, and, and just preach this." No. I'd rather live in a tent underneath the uh, uh, San Jacinto River Amen. Bridge than to compromise and to back down and to say, "Uh, uh, we're, you know, to to accept things that are being accepted in most churches today." You see, the problem is, is that we have forgotten that there's people behind us. We have forgotten that there's somebody that's coming up behind us that needs the help and needs the strength. Do you realize that suicide is, is rampant among Christians today? Do you realize that divorce is rampant among Christians today? Do you realize that the destruction of a home is rampant in, in most churches today? Why is that? It's because Satan desires to have you. Satan doesn't want you building a Christian home. Satan doesn't want you building a Christian marriage. Satan doesn't want you to, uh, to, uh, uh, to build uh, upon the foundations of the Word of God. And so he says here, and Jesus tells Simon, Peter in verse number 31, he says, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as you. <laughs> Now, if you stop and you look at Peter's life, Peter is the, the, uh, the outspoken, quote-unquote, apostle. And most of the time when he speaks out, he's got a size 9 stuffed in his mouth. It's called foot-mouth disease. 
I mean, every time Peter opens his mouth, it seems in the New Testament, he's got something stupid to say. He, he's not, he, you know, but he does have an, an occasional smart thought. When Jesus came to his disciples and he said, hey, hey, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're John, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. And he looked at his disciples and said, who say ye that I am? And Peter spoke up. Thou art the Christ, yeah. the Son of the living God. That's what he said. Jesus looked at him and said, flesh and blood had to still reveal that to you. <laughs> you yeah. didn't get that. You didn't get yeah. that from man. You got that from your heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. I mean, that was a smart. That was a smart statement. You know, when, when Peter was, uh, uh, and, and the disciples were in that boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they were uh, going over to the other side, and a storm came up, and uh, and, the, and the ship was being tossed to and fro, and, uh, and 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 they were wondering if they were going to make it to the other side. They looked up and they saw something walking towards them, and they say, "It is a spirit." Peter said, no, I don't think it's the Spirit. I think that's Jesus. Yeah. And he gets, a, he gets an eye full of Jesus. He said, hey, Lord, bid me to walk and, uh, on the water. Because we, we want to criticize Peter for getting out of the boat and, and walking to Jesus and taking his eyes off Jesus and sinking down into that, uh, into that, uh, into that Sea of Galilee and Jesus reaching down and, his, and, and, and lifting him up and putting him back in the boat. We want to criticize Peter for that. The other, nine, the other nine didn't get out. The other 11 didn't get out of that boat. Amen. They weren't the ones that asked Jesus to walk on the water. Peter says, hey, I, I want you to know that I'm trusting the Lord. But you know, in the midst of trials and tests, it's a little hard sometimes to trust the Lord. Amen. It's a little hard to, uh, to think about what, you know, when all of this is going on around you. And he, he, he began to look around at all of that and he began to sink down. And he said, Lord, save me. That's all he said. Yeah. Lord, save me. And immediately he was in the boat. Immediately he was in the place where he needed to be. You see... He says, now Simon, he said, he said that the, has, has desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you. Let me give you a bit of knowledge. The Lord prays for you every single day. Yeah. Romans chapter number 8 tells us that he makes intercession for us daily. Yeah. Not only does he make intercession for us daily, but, not, uh, but the Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us daily. Romans chapter number 8. Here we have the Lord Jesus. He said, I have prayed for thee. And notice what he says. That thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now a lot of people want to look at that word converted and say when Peter gets saved. Peter's already saved. He's been following Jesus for three and a half years. If you will take your Bible, go back to Luke chapter number 5. Let's look at Peter here in Luke chapter number 5. Notice what he says in verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to, uh, to hear the word of God. The people pressed upon him to do what? To hear the word of God. And notice what it says. He stood by, uh, he, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, uh, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, and, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little uh, from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drop. He says, Simon, he said, now I'm going to, for, for the use of your ship, for your willingness to, to allow me to sit in your ship and, and teach this multitude of people, he said, I want you to launch out into the deep for a draw. And Simon, verse number five, answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. 
Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Yeah. Simon, sitting there washing his net, he, he, he allowed Jesus to use the ship, and I'm sure he's listening to the message that Jesus is preaching there by the lake of Gennesaret. He says, launch out and, 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 and to the, and he goes, Lord, we, we've worked all night. We're tired. We want to go home. We want to go to bed. But, at thy word. At thy word. At thy word. And when they had, verse number six, this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes yeah. and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and they, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they uh, began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, the Lord. Repentance. For he was astonished at all that were uh, with and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which he had taken. And, and so was the also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch me. What was, what was Jesus telling Simon? He said, look, he said, you see this great draw of fish? You see this great benefit that, that you get from being obedient to me? That is nothing. Yeah. <coughs> That's nothing. From henceforth, from this very day, from this very minute, you shall catch men. I'd like to go to verse number 11. And notice that when he said, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. And follow him. What about Amen. That? Amen. I mean, they had seen what Jesus could do. You and I are sitting here this morning as living examples of what Jesus can do in the heart and the life of an individual that would surrender themselves and say, Lord, I need Jesus. I need you. I can't make this on my own. See, the problem is that we, we've been trying, we, we tried that. We, we tried to, to heap to ourselves and we tried to benefit it. And we've toiled all the night and we've not been successful. And when Jesus comes in, he says, I got it all covered. I've got it taken care of. Just follow me. They forsook all immediately. They left everything. Don't you know that those ships cost something? Sure. Don't you know that, uh, that that tackle costs something? Don't you know that, uh, that the, 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 the mast, the, 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 the uh, uh, what do you call those things that you send up, the, the sails? Don't you know that that, 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 that ship, and there was more than one of them, that their business, they had a lot, a lot of monetary involvement. They came down and said, that's nothing. The Bible says they forsook all and followed him. For three and a half years, they, they listened to him and as he taught and as he trained them, as he, as he led them, as he taught them the things of God, as he taught them the mysteries of God that, that the prophets of old uh, desired to know and were not, uh, were not made privy to, these disciples were made known the things of God and the principles of God and the teachings of God and the mysteries of God. And now Jesus says, it's time for me to go. Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. I'm praying for you that you fail not. Good. He said, but when you are converted. That word converted means to return back to the place where you belong. If you turn to John chapter number 21, I want you to notice something here. John chapter number 21, we see Peter again. 
Jesus has died on the cross of Calvary, and they uh, and uh, he's been buried, and and, and he's uh, uh, risen again. They've heard the testimony. They've seen the empty tomb. They've seen the empty grave. But notice in chapter twenty-one of John it says, and um, and Simon Peter said unto them, verse number three, I go fishing. And they said unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught what? Yeah. Nothing. And when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not what it, that it was Jesus. You see, Jesus told Simon, he said, Simon, he said, I want you to understand something. I'm going to be offered. I'm going to die. I'm going to pay the ransom for many. Yeah. When you're converted, strengthen thy brethren. When you come back to the place, Simon, of realizing that, that you have, have strayed and realizing that, that you could not do this on your own. You remember what, G, what Peter told Jesus? He said, though all men forsake me, yet will I trust thee. I will die with thee. I will go to prison. I, 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 will, I will pay the, the ultimate sacrifice of life. And Jesus looked at him and said, before the cock crows tonight, you will have denied me thrice, three times. Oh, no, 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 no. And as Jesus is being examined uh, before the, the high court, and, and, and Simon Peter has gotten as close as he can to kind of see what was going on, and they say, hey, hey, you're one of them. You're one of those uh, uh, followers of Jesus. Oh, I'm not either. Oh, yes, you are. I, I, I've seen you. I, I, didn't, didn't you see him with, 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 with that Jesus? I don't know the man. Your speech betrays you. You don't talk like the rest. You, you've got, a, you've got a, a godly language. There's something different about the way you speak and the way that you talk. And Peter says, I blankety blank, 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 don't know the man. Yeah. And immediately he heard the cock crow. One pastor says he turned, met the eyes of Jesus, yeah. and he went out and went up. Yeah. Is there a time in your life when you know that you personally have failed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. And all you could do was weep and cry. Peter says, my life is ruined. There's nothing left. I go off fishing. The rest of them says, well, we ain't got nothing else better to do either, so we'll just go for it. They see Jesus. In chapter 21, verse number 12, John says, Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. None of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, love us thou me. Three times he comes to Peter and he said, Simon, son of Jonas, love us thou me. And three times, the one that was boisterous, the one that was willing to speak up, and the one that was willing to, to ask questions, and the one that was willing to, to say, Lord, let me come out on the sea. The, the one that was willing to say, hey, hey, you're the son of a living God. Said, Lord, you know all things. You're asking me if I love you unconditionally with the greatest of love. Just like the love that, that God has for the son and the son has for the children. And I'm not willing to state that right now. You see where I'm at, Lord? I failed you. I failed you in a big way. 
You said I would deny you. And I said, no, I would never deny you. Lord, you know I love you. That word in the love there in the King James, if you look at the Greek, is phileo. Common love. The love that we have for our friends, our acquaintances. Simon, son of Jonah, who lovest thou me. Again, he says, Lord, look at me. I'm a mess. I failed. I haven't reached the potential that you wanted for me. Wow. You prayed for me, and I, and I failed anyway. You told me in, in, before your death, you said Satan desires to sift you as wheat. And you still told me you were praying for me that my faith wouldn't fail and my faith has fallen. And you're asking me if I love you with the unconditional, undying love that you have for me. I can't answer that, Lord. Wow. He goes a third time. Simon, do you love me as a friend? If you're not willing to, to, to state the fact the way it is, would you just love me as a friend? Lord, you know I love you. You see, we've all failed. We've all, we've, we've all messed up. And Peter looks around and he, he says, you know, Lord, you told me to strengthen the brethren. <laughs> How can I strengthen them when I'm a mess? Amen. <laughs> Turn over to Acts chapter number one. I said this at the beginning. Not really a part of the message, but they're watching Jesus. He tells them in Luke chapter 24, he says, Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter number 1, <coughs> notice what he says in verse number 6. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, what wilt thou at this time, wilt thou at this time restore thy kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power if the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which, thou, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. Here's the promise. They saw the reality of what Jesus had been teaching them. All along. There's three responses that I see of Peter in Acts chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. The first one is found in verses 12 through 14. And for time, I'll not read them. But uh, I want you to understand that what the, that the, they went back to Jerusalem. They went back to where they were to tarry uh, from, uh, from the mount called Olivet, which is at Jerusalem. Verse number 12 says, uh, a, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where a boat, and it lists the disciples there, uh, and says in verse number 14, and they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The first thing that they did, after seeing Jesus ascend up into heaven, they went back to where Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem and to be endued with power from on high. And I will tell you today, the lacking of the church today is spirit-filled Christians. Amen. That's the problem. Yes, sir. 
It's not a lack of churches because we have many of them. And it's not a lack of, of people uh, opening the Bible and preaching the Word of God because we have a lot of people so, uh, doing that. It's a lack of prayer with God. Amen. They stayed there in that upper room until they were endued with power from on high. Secondly, they got organized. They, they, they made it a matter of prayer. What is it that we're going to do? How is it that we're going to do it? We're going to tarry here until God gives us the answer. And then they got organized. Notice who the organizer was. Verse number 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the, of the disciples and said, uh, the number of, about, of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture must be these people have been fulfilled. And he got organized. He got them in the place where they needed to be and, 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 and positionally where they were supposed to be. You remember Judas Iscariot uh, uh, went out and hung himself. They needed, they needed to be 12. And so they chose a, another disciple to be in their place. And they tarried there. So first of all, it was a matter of prayer. Secondly, it was a matter of organization. And thirdly, it was a matter of obedience. Look at verse, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were obedient to God. They stayed in the place where God wanted them. He said, you know, nothing, we, we've been praying for two days and, and nothing has happened. Let, let's move over here to, 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 Car, to Capernaum. Uh, let's move over here to Galilee. Let's move over here to, to Jericho. Let's move over here. No, they, they stayed where they were supposed to stay. That's the problem with a lot of churches. People just keep moving everywhere. Yeah, amen. I know, I, know, I know one family uh, that they have been almost in every independent Baptist church in East Texas in the area that they live in. Every single one of them. And I talk to them, the personal friends, and the conversation always starts like this. We love our pastor, but... My wife will tell you that she's heard the conversation. We love our pastor, but, and I'll guarantee you, there's, a, there's something coming that they didn't like. So they left that church, and then they went to another church. And they were there for a few months, and we love our pastor, but. You see, these guys said, no, Jesus told us to stay here in Jerusalem until we be endued with power from on high. We're going to be there. And it says in chapter 2, they were all in one accord. They were in one place. They were doing exactly what they were told to do. Verse number 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If they had left that upper room, they would have made it. Right. You see, we, we, we always want God's blessing. We always, want, we, we, we always want God's answer. We, we, we pray and we pray and we pray, and, and it just doesn't happen in our timetable, and so we just give up. We can quit praying. How many of your prayers would have been answered in a different way had you kept on persevering and kept on praying until the light shone through, until God said, this is the answer. This is what I'm going to do. This is what happened to those that day uh, on the day of Pentecost. They were in one accord. It says in the beginning uh, uh, of their of their sojourn in the upper room. It says that in chapter 2, verse 1, they were in one accord, assembled in the place where God told them to be, and God came down, and God met. Amen. 
That's why it's important to be in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, when, because you don't know when God's going to show up. You don't know when God's going to come down and do a miracle in the heart and life. That's why you don't know if, who you're praying for when God's going to do the work and God's going to, to miraculously save that individual. 120. They began to proclaim the truth of the word of God in the power of God. The miracle uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost was not the, the speaking in tongues. That's right. It was 3,000 souls being saved. Yeah, that's right. That was the miracle. I, li I like uh, 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 Dr. Norris Belcher preached a message one time on this. And it, it, he said, it, you know, it, it's like, you know, putting a, a million dollars in a paper bag. And giving it to one of the uh, needy people in the church and, and giving them that, 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 pla that paper bag of a million dollars. And they dump all the million dollars out and look at the bag. Say, look how, how, look, he gave me a bag. Look at this bag. This is a wonderful bag. It's not the bag. It's what's inside the bag. Yeah. And it wasn't the, the, the tongues. It was what came forth from those tongues. Amen. Yeah. Right. They heard them preach the message in 18 different languages, and 3,000 souls were saved. You see, that's the difference. You say, well, I'm not qualified to, to, tell, to tell anybody about Jesus. You're as qualified as I am. Amen. It doesn't say in, in Matthew 28, 18 or 19, uh, it's the preacher's responsibility. It says, go ye. Ye means y'all. It's plural. Go ye into all the world. It doesn't say go preacher. It doesn't say go deacon. It doesn't say go choir member. It doesn't say go Sunday school teacher. And every single one of them ought to be going. But the truth is, it's your responsibility as much as it is mine. Yeah. You see, these went out and they spoke the word of God, 120 of them, in 18 different languages. They were accused of, uh, of, of, uh, of being drunk. And then Peter gets up. And that, the, the greatest message ever preached was preached on the day of Pentecost. By the man who denied his Lord, yeah. who cussed, yeah. and turned his back upon God. You men of Galilee, these men are not drunken as you suppose. But today has happened what Joel talked about. The prophet. I will pour out my spirit upon all things. You see, if we're going to do anything in 2013, it's because we are going to come back to the place that Peter came to. We're going to come to the place of, 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 of repentance towards God. And we're going to come to the place of realizing that we are nothing and he's everything. And then we're going to do our best to bring up somebody behind us. An enduring legacy. I was thinking the other day about those that were saved listening to D.L. Moody. Here he was, a shoe cobbler, shoe salesman. On the streets of Chicago. <coughs> Sunday school teacher goes and leads him to the Lord. Never ordained to the gospel ministry. Starts Sunday school class and begins to bring boys and girls and teach them God, the word of God. <coughs> goes to a meeting and preaching in a in a, in a meeting and Two little ladies sit in front of him and say, Hey, Moody, we're praying for you that God would fill you with the Holy Spirit of God. He said, Don't pray for me, pray for the people that need to be saved. He got offended. But those two ladies would tell him he needed to be filled with the power of God. But it was so burning upon his heart. Yes, sir. And God so moved into his life. This shoe salesman, this last Sunday school teacher slash preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Got into a room in New York and God filled him mightily with the power of God. And it says the messages that he preached at first 
where maybe 10 or 12 were saved. He preached the same message and thousands were saved. What was the difference? The Spirit of God in the heart and the life. You say, well, that's just for preachers. That's not in my Bible. Right. My Bible, my Bible says, be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's an imperative. That is a, 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 a command from the Word of God that we are to be filled with the power of God to do the work of God. And you can do that. I can do that. You see, outside these doors, there's some 80,000, 90,000 people Many of them have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of them are out there hurting on drugs and alcohol. Many are out there uh, 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 contemplating suicide, contemplating death, contemplating uh, everything. And we have the answer. You're right, friend. We have the answer. And if we would get together, the, the ones of us that are here today, and say, God, in 2013, I am going to seek to allow God to use me that I can influence my children or I can influence my grandchildren or I can influence somebody behind me to bring them to the place where I'm at today so that they can see Jesus. See Jesus. You see, when you have to be in the front, you have to be the limelight. You have to have your name in lights. You have to be, you haven't come to that place yet. You tell us, right? You've got to come to the place and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm willing to be in the darkness. I'm willing to be in the shadows to let Jesus show shine. Pride and arrogancy and position are never going to bring you what you need. It's Jesus. Good John chapter 21. Jesus comes to Peter. Simon, do you love me? He said, Look, I'm willing to step in the back. God used Peter mightily because Peter realized that Peter wasn't the one doing the work. Yeah. You come back to chapter 21 of John, it says they go fishing and they did what? They toiled all night and caught nothing. Again, Jesus tells them, cast them on the other side. They followed Jesus' direction and they took in a whole again. It's all Jesus. <coughs> Jesus. What are we going to do? How are we going to reach it? Well, come back tonight and I'll lay the plan out. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you. This morning for your blessing. We thank you for the truth of the word of God. Lord, we need to build an enduring legacy this year. Lord, those of us that are here this morning need to determine in our hearts and in our lives, we're going to bring somebody with us. We're going to teach them and we're going to train them and we're going to, to be a mentor to them so that we can get them to Jesus. Lord, it all starts right here. Today. Lord, I pray that you'd work in the heart and the life of those that are here. There might be someone here this morning that's unsaved. If they were to die right now, they don't know Jesus. Lord, I pray that they'd come to know Jesus today. Lord, maybe there's some here this morning that are saved, and they know they're saved, but their, their heart is cold and indifferent. Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord. Be a help and encourage them to bring them where they Father, maybe there's some here that 
they're not members of the Garth Road Baptist Church, but this is where you want to be. Or may they come and start this new year on the right step, following the right path, going the right direction, to help us to reach this lost and dying Jerusalem that surrounds us. Speak to our heart. It's our prayer, Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.